The Bitcoin white paper isn't only a significant piece of crypto history, but it's also one of the best documents to read if you want to understand the origin of crypto, how it works, and how it's changing the world. The main problem with the Bitcoin white paper is that it's not super easy to understand. I had to read it more than 10 times. I also read a couple of different books talking about cryptocurrency and blockchain technology in general, as well as the early days of Bitcoin. So before I break down Bitcoin, why it was created, what problems it solves, and how it works, I thought it would be helpful to compare Bitcoin to gold and address the main problems associated with digital currencies like Bitcoin. Gold is valuable because of its naturally occurring properties. It's scarce, durable, portable, divisible, fungible, hard to fake, and easy to authenticate. But Bitcoin is better than gold because it's not only scarce, but it has a fixed supply of 21 million coins. If Bitcoin can be subdivided into 100 million pieces, so you can own as little as 0.0000001 Bitcoin, Plus you can send it instantly like a DM. It's also enforced by computer code. So instead of humans controlling how it functions, the code is an unchangeable law that exists indefinitely. The main question now, which the Bitcoin white paper clearly solves is what prevents someone from spending the same Bitcoin twice? This is the main issue with digital currency that doesn't exist with physical money. If I give you a hundred dollar bill, I can't turn around and give that same bill to someone else because I've already spent it. But I can text the same image to thousands of people and claim that it's the only one. So what prevents us from doing that with Bitcoin? Well, to understand that, we need to understand the Bitcoin white paper, so let's get right into it. So why was Bitcoin created? What is wrong with our current monetary system? Our current financial system relies on a trust-based network of middlemen. Since we can't trust each other when transacting, especially if you are transacting with a stranger somewhere around the world, we have to rely on a third party, such as a bank. The problem with these middlemen, such as the bank, is that they lead to increased cost, require a lot of personal information, transactions can be reversed and we can't make trustless online transactions. So that's why Satoshi Nakamoto created a trustless peer-to-peer -peer network that relies on cryptographic proof so that two people can transact without a middleman. So how does Bitcoin actually function? What I'm about to go over provides context, important context for the rest of the Bitcoin white paper. So make sure to pay attention. The answer to how Bitcoin works is called mining. Miners are people who run special software on their computers worldwide that audit Bitcoin transactions by solving complex math problems which are created by the transactions themselves. Once a miner solves a new block or set of transactions, it is then added to the Bitcoin blockchain, which is a global ledger of Bitcoin transactions since the beginning of Bitcoin. As an incentive, Bitcoin miners are rewarded with newly created Bitcoins, which is also known as the block reward. And the reason why there is an incentive is because it costs a lot of money, computational power, electricity to power the computers that mine Bitcoin. And generally the more computing power the miner uses, the better are their odds of winning a Bitcoin block reward. In more technical terms, the greater a miner's hash rate is, the better their chances are. So what's a hash rate? Hash rate or hashes per second is a measurement of computational power, as in how many computations, hashes a computer can perform in one second. I really like this analogy from the book Bitcoin Billionaires, where Cameron Winklevoss compares how Bitcoin works to Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. The little kid in the movie, Charlie, spends his time looking for the golden ticket in a Wonka bar wrapper. Think of Charlie as a Bitcoin miner. The golden ticket, which grants Charlie access to a tour of the Wonka factory, is the block reward. Now, just imagine for a second while Charlie is looking for this golden ticket, every chocolate bar he buys, he is also validating the purchase of each chocolate bar and then recording it on the factory's ledger, the Willy Wonka blockchain. Now, imagine there are thousands of Charlies all over the world doing the same thing, looking for a golden ticket. As each Charlie opens up a Wonka bar, they are auditing the Willy Wonka blockchain and checking each other's work. By incentivizing all of the Charlies with the possibility of finding this golden ticket that grants them access to the Willy Wonka factory, they work together to validate and record every transaction on the Willy Wonka blockchain. This helps Willy Wonka keep track of who paid for what and allows his factory to stay in business. So instead of middlemen, you have a public competition of miners, each incentivized to validate transactions. So in Bitcoin's case, each middleman is replaced with a mathematical equation, or in Cameron's example, Charlie Buckets. Now we get into the actual meat of the white paper, the first being transactions. How do transactions on the Bitcoin blockchain work? First, there are two very important terms to know, public and private key. A public key is like your email address. You can share it with anyone and you can use it to 
receive Bitcoin. Also, anyone can view your public key on the Bitcoin network. They can see all the transactions you've completed, as well as how much Bitcoin you hold. And this is exactly how the Bitcoin network or the ledger tracks every single transaction. The private key, on the other hand, is like your email password. You want to keep it private because you use this to access and control any Bitcoin in your digital wallet. Your private key is also used as your digital signature to initiate and complete any transactions on the blockchain. So when you send a coin to someone else, you sign a special code using your private key, which contains the previous transaction details as well as the next owner's public key. The signature proves ownership and it's added to the coin's history. The next person can check the list of signatures to confirm ownership history. The drawback to this list is that there is no way to verify if any of the previous owners double spent their Bitcoin. With our current monetary system, a third party such as a bank keeps track of all the transactions to ensure that no one is double spending their digital currency. But again, the point of Bitcoin is to eliminate any middleman such as a bank. So there needs to be a way to verify that all previous owners did not make another transaction or create a fake list of transactions. When it comes to Bitcoin, the earliest transaction, the first transaction is the most trustworthy transaction. But in order to know the first First transaction, we really have to know all of the transactions. Bitcoin does this by publicly announcing every single transaction and then having everyone verify that the transaction is true. But who is everyone and how do they know which transaction came first? By everyone, I mean the miners from the Willy Wonka factory example. And as far as how they know which transactions came first, this is the second portion of the Bitcoin white paper called the timestamp server, which explains how each transaction is timestamped. Say I buy a pizza for one Bitcoin. Once the transaction is approved, it's timestamped and broadcasted to the rest of the world or rather the miners. But how do the miners know that this is the only transaction and it hasn't been duplicated? This is done using the proof of work mechanism as described in the Bitcoin white paper. The goal of the proof of work mechanism is to determine which ledger is the legit one if there happens to be a fake. It does this using hashes. I'm going to try to better explain how hashes work using a blender and smoothie analogy. In order to make a smoothie, you need a blender. You mix the ingredients together, you toss it into the blender, and then you have a delicious smoothie as a result. In terms of Bitcoin, the ingredients are the items in your ledger, the blender is the hash function, and the smoothie is the hash. Just like a smoothie can't be changed back into whole fruits, a hash function can't be reversed. It's easy to come up with a hash or a smoothie, but impossible to start with a hash and turn it into ingredients. Also, any ingredients or data that you throw into the blender or the function will ultimately change the smoothie, aka the hash. The hash is stored on the Bitcoin network, but in order for the Bitcoin network to accept the hash, it actually has to have a special number of zeros in front of the hash. In terms of the smoothie analogy, you can think of this like a secret ingredient, but it's actually called the nonce. But the only way to find out what this secret ingredient is, is by guessing and just tossing in random ingredients. And this is exactly what miners spend energy on until one of them finds the correct ingredient. Again, all by guessing. And this is all done through the network, which is the next part of the Bitcoin white paper. As I mentioned earlier, the entire Bitcoin network is run by anyone who has a computer with the special software and an internet connection. These computers are called nodes. There are currently 50,000 nodes all around the world that are verifying Bitcoin transactions in hopes of earning a block reward, AKA the golden ticket. So here's exactly how it works. Let me just break it down really quickly. A transaction is made, it's broadcasted to all the nodes. Each node tries to guess the special smoothie ingredient. Once a node finds the correct ingredient and tells all the other nodes, then all the other nodes check to confirm it's the right ingredient. If correct, all the nodes make a copy of that transaction. Each node keeps a list of running transactions that are all connected to one another to form a chain of transactions. If there are two versions broadcasted, both versions are saved until one ledger becomes longer. If a coin was duplicated and someone tried to spin it twice, the fake ledger would have to keep up with the legit ledger, which is almost impossible and no one would want to do that anyways. The legit ledger will always grow faster because it's secured by miners who have the most computational power. This makes it practically impossible for a fake ledger with a double spent coin to ever catch up to the real ledger. So as long as there are more honest miners than malicious ones, the legit ledger will always remain true and secure. And that's why the network offers an incentive, which is the next portion of the Bitcoin white paper, so that miners are more tempted to do the right thing. It's arguably more profitable to earn a block reward versus is trying to create a fake ledger or double spend a coin. And that's why there continues to be more honest miners.
blockers. When Bitcoin was first created, when it was first deployed, each block reward was actually 50 Bitcoins. However, for every 210,000 blocks, which is a group of transactions, the block reward actually gets cut in half. This is better known as the Bitcoin halving. This will continue until all 21 million Bitcoins are created. And at that point, the Bitcoin white paper suggests that miners will be rewarded with transaction fees as opposed to newly created Bitcoins. The next section of the white paper talks about how Bitcoin reclaims disk space. It's not super important or that exciting, so I will just give you a brief overview of this section. It simply explains how Bitcoin nodes can efficiently discard old transaction data that isn't necessarily needed anymore while still securing the blockchain. That way it reduces the amount of space needed to run a full Bitcoin node. Next, the Bitcoin white paper discusses the simplified payment verification, which describes a method for lightweight users to verify transactions related to their own wallet addresses by requesting only specific transaction information from full nodes. This allows users to verify their own transactions and maintain a certain level of security without having to request a copy of the blockchain. Next, the white paper also describes the combining and splitting of value. Combining means gathering a small amount of Bitcoin to make a single larger payment, while splitting involves breaking down a larger amount into smaller portions for smaller transactions. This is done to help manage Bitcoin more efficiently. This leads us to the privacy portion of the Bitcoin white paper. Bitcoin transactions don't reveal your real identity because it uses your wallet's public address. Therefore, you can send and receive Bitcoin without actually giving any personal details. The white paper points out that while Bitcoin is pretty private, patterns in transaction data could potentially be used to identify a user. This is because you have to use a centralized exchange, which does require KYC, know your customer, which is all your personal information. So if you were holding Bitcoin on a digital wallet, a crypto wallet, eventually if you want to cash it out for fiat currency, you would have to transfer it back to a centralized exchange. Therefore, someone could potentially connect the two together. Now the calculations section of the Bitcoin white paper explains how cryptographic hash functions and mining processes are used to secure and verify transactions which it pretty much covers throughout the entire white paper. And by this point, we already have a pretty good idea of how the miners work when it comes to the Bitcoin blockchain. All that said, it's pretty insane to think just how simple yet innovative Bitcoin actually is. It's a system that doesn't rely on trust. Instead, it uses digital signatures to verify who is the owner of a coin and prevents double spending. And the network is super secure because it uses proof of work and super powerful computers. It keeps an unchangeable record of transactions and anyone can join the network without revealing their identity. Basically, they make sure everything is fair by agreeing on the rules altogether. But who thinks of all this stuff? Well, Satoshi Nakamoto did. But who or what is Satoshi Nakamoto? The true identity of Satoshi Nakamoto is not known. All we know is that it is a person or group of people who created the Bitcoin white paper and initiated the first block. Despite many speculations and investigations over the years, no one has been able to confirm who exactly Satoshi Nakamoto is. Satoshi did communicate with the early Bitcoin community via online forums and email, but gradually withdrew from the public discussions around 2010. It is important to note that the identity of Satoshi Nakamoto has no impact on the functioning of the Bitcoin blockchain as it operates independently of its creator. Some people even believe it's Steve Jobs and some people People believe it's literally this guy named Satoshi Nakamoto. Drop a comment and let me know who you think Satoshi Nakamoto might be. Also, if you want to know how to safely store your Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, then this next video is for you.